so our next speaker is Arfon Smith from GitHub. Um, Arfon, he's going to tell us about predicting the future of publishing. <laughs> we'll hand over to him. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thanks, uh, thanks for letting me speak here today. Um, uh, full disclosure, I'm not going to predict the future of publishing today. I thought I would just, it's a clickbait title or something. Um, um, but what I want to talk about today is I work at a company called GitHub. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. We publish a lot of software, and we just saw some researchers publishing data on, on, on our site. Um, I want to talk about um, some things that open source software communities do. And I think where we could kind of copy um, some strategies that they use to improve reproducibility or verification, whatever you want to call it, some sort of strategies we could copy over from open source. Because uh, there are communities doing things uh, on GitHub that I think academics would benefit from enormously. So uh, I'm going to commit the cardinal sin for just 30 seconds and tell you like why I'm here. So this is me being an astronomer. I used to do that. That's a big telescope. I then had a brief stint in bioinformatics for a year where I um, helped build out sequencing pipelines for what was then called next generation sequencing. I'm assuming that the mini ions now the next generation, but this was the the kind of uh, 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 the uh, Illumina type sequencing. And then I had about five years building crowdsourcing platforms, so Galaxy Zoo and the Zooniverse was uh, uh, what I was doing at Oxford for a number of years. Um, the reason I want to tell you that is because all of my career thus far post-academia has been building software in academic domains. And so that leads me directly to GitHub. This is our uh, mascot. We have a cat crossed with an octopus. I will tell you at the bar later why. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, you know, I think one of the things that we see on GitHub is that, you know, version control is something that's kind of core to software, something that has to be done well. And GitHub is not a first generation attempt by the software community at solving uh, ways to collaborate together. It's probably the third or fourth generation. Uh, pretty popular at the moment, but, you know, it is, it is just basically a system for versioning. And, of course, for most of us in this room, this is version control. Um, and I, um, I challenge you to not show me a folder on your computer that looks like that. Um, and that, that is version control. It's just not very good version control. And I don't know which is the latest. You know, there's, uh, by the way, uh, if you want to know how to get a, uh, uh, my supervisor used to put underscores at the start of file names, because that brings the file to the top of the tree. And so he had underscore, 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 underscore paper. So he versioned with underscores. That is a way of doing version control. There is another way that we prefer, which is this technology called Git. Um, and it was built originally to manage the source code around the Linux kernel. It was actually built by Linus Torvald. Um, he famously named software after himself. Um, and so what it looks like on GitHub, this is a, an example of a project, a repository. This is a maths textbook being written by about 40 different authors. And Git gives you, this is in LaTeX, so it's a technology uh, or a uh, file format that sort of lends itself pretty well to uh, Git versioning. You get explicit versioning. So this is our kind of underscore, underscore, underscore version here. We get explicit versioning. We get, if you've ever seen a diff in source code, they look, there's a kind of red-green thing, red to remove all greens addition. You get red-greens. You can see line-by-line -line changes versioning of these documents. So this is basically kind of what GitHub looks like. This is for a, for a manuscript, but you can imagine the same in software. And people use it for a whole bunch of different things. So this is, you know, somebody sharing a little template file here that configures a project. And so this is just a single file that's being shared by and reused by a whole bunch of people. Or kind of at the biggest scale, certainly this is the biggest project I know of in academia. This is the data pipeline software for the CMS experiment on the Large Hadron Collider. So this is one of the project teams. CMS is one of the two big experiments. And they share all of their software uh, on GitHub. And this is about 7 million lines of C++, C, lots of different types of things. Um, but GitHub is uh, pretty big. This is 2014 data. So we've been going about seven years. And we're coming up to, we're actually over now. We're up about 24 million projects on GitHub, <coughs> people sharing stuff. Uh, and in terms of community, uh, we're well over 10 million now, I believe, uh, uh, in 2015. And about 700,000 of these people have an academic email address. That doesn't mean they're academics. It means they might have been a university student at some point. We have a pretty strong education program. But there's people, lots of people kind of publishing things, I would call them, on GitHub in academia. Sometimes it looks like paper. Sometimes it's data sets. Um, academics are pretty good at hacking GitHub, like white hat hacking. I don't think we've had any uh, nasty hacking. But, you know, trying, trying out the system. And so when I think about publishing 
on GitHub. I'm not really talking about this. Uh, uh, Scott uh, is right. He did get to say everything first. I have at least three duplicate slides. Uh, so there we go. Uh, his prediction was true. I don't want to talk about this today. This is not the kind of publishing that uh, I want to talk about. I want to talk about something much more tailored towards GitHub and something that uh, uh, is becoming more and more important. And that's kind of publishing of software and I guess data as well, but then thinking about how open source communities build services around, around what they do. And so um, just because uh, it's easier to make grand sweeping assumptions and then, and then project from them, I want to state my kind of assumptions today for this talk. Uh, and so uh, one, the first is that open is the new normal. Uh, I think you know, we can talk about open access, we can talk about open source. I think you know, the, the, the tide is moving in, you know, is in very much moving in that direction. And for my assumption through the rest of the talk is that open is conventional. Um, and you know, that might not be true in some fields, but I would argue that it is going to become. And we, again, things to argue about in the bar later or at coffee. Um, number two, this I think is pretty uncontroversial, uh, is that the PDF is a pretty terrible way of sharing most research uh, these days, especially in the data intensive sciences. And the third, and I, hopefully this isn't that controversial either, we heard a lot from uh, Scott about this already, that we're really not sharing data and software in a useful way and also a creditable way. Like we don't really have very good mechanisms for uh, crediting either use, reuse, and sharing of, of software and data. And so, so when I think about software and data, um, there are some research areas that are you know, ahead of others just because of sheer necessity. And I think uh, one, of the, uh, one of the kind of big drivers that we see in terms of the communities using GitHub is, are the data intensive sciences. And so this is maybe this, maybe somebody will show this again later, but there's this idea, it's not a new one now, it's kind of one of the kind of, kind of origins of the e-science movement, I guess, is that there's this narrative that we're in this new kind of fourth paradigm of research. And so uh, the first being experimental, um, I'm a chemist originally by trade, so you know, throwing something in a fire, seeing a color and writing it down and thinking, gosh, that's interesting. Uh, the next phase is theoretical, trying to kind of think about uh, what, what could explain these observations you've made. The third is a computational era, and the argument is that things like the kind of HPC or the uh, kind of early phases of the HPC era, uh, simulating uh, chemical chemical reactions in a computer, this is this co kind of computational age. And the, the, the idea is that this fourth paradigm, this is an open source book, by the way, you can get on the Microsoft Research uh, website, uh, is that we're in this data intensive phase of research. And so you hear data deluge, data flood. I prefer data bonanza, because it sounds more uh, like there's more opportunity. Uh, and you could, wherever you look in research, we see this. So uh, um, in my background in astrophysics, is, this is the next survey telescope in astrophysics, and it's going to—it's you know, being built right now. They've made the mirror, they're flattening the mountain, and laying bricks in, in Chile. Uh, this thing is going to produce uh, something. It's going to do video astronomy, basically. It's going to survey the sky every three nights, and so it's going to look for things that change. And changing things could be asteroids, uh, which uh, we maybe should care a lot about. Some of them we don't care that much about. Some of them might hit us. Uh, but it also will find lots of supernovae, lots of variable stars, basically any transient object in the sky. This thing's going to produce, I think, something like uh, uh, 50 petabytes of data a year or something. It's some kind of order of magnitude around that. Or if we look in something like climate science, we've got these enormous high-resolution simulations where the, the kind of commonality here is that just working with the data is, is, a, is hard. Like even, even if you have a research question, a kind of rate-limiting step in data-intensive research is building tools and ways of approaching that data so you can even begin to ask research questions. Here's my second duplicate slide. This is the mini-iron. Uh, this is our next generation uh, sequencing for today. This, you know, these things are uh, producing both large volumes of data but also you know, uh, at a cost that's really, really... Uh, uh, approachable. So we're looking at, you know, $1,000 genomes instead of billion-dollar genomes. And so, so all of these kind of, uh, 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 all of these kind of, the commonality here is that this is kind of big science. This is a problem, and we don't necessarily have the tools and the ways of working with these. And so the, the kind of narrative in the kind of data-intensive research is that as we become more and more data-intensive, we need to find new tools, new ways of working, but also new, to, new tools and new ways of publishing these tools, because um, the PDF basically is becoming an increasingly unsatisfactory of way of sharing, sharing our research. And so Victoria Sodden, who's now, um, um, uh, I don't think she's 
Uh, she's now somewhere, one of the universities in Illinois, uh, which I should know. I live in Chicago, so I should definitely know where she lives. Uh, but anyway, she has this very good narrative about um, how as more and more scholarship moves into software, then we have this crisis in reproducibility. And so this is my one slide summary of her talk. As we become more and more data intensive, if we restrict ourselves to kind of conventional publishing, then we're, we're, we're kind of our chance, our opportunity of reproducing or even necessarily understanding the work fully uh, uh, decreases. And there's another way to think about this, uh, and I know uh, Titus Brown, who's uh, very big in the kind of open, um, uh, open uh, lab book kind of publishing, um, has this idea that it's actually certainly for the biosciences, we're getting to territory where people are applying methods that are uh, not necessarily understood. We've got kind of black box methods where we've got a lab who can buy all these, produce all this data, have all these sequences. So we've got all this data going in. We're kind of turning the handle, producing results where we don't necessarily understand, uh, maybe not even qualified uh, necessarily to understand some of the results coming out. Often because the methods that are being applied are black box, haven't necessarily been published themselves, or there's been a written description made of them. And we're producing science at the end, and we don't, we're not really sure whether we know uh, whether it's uh, uh, true or not. So this is obviously, obviously not good. Um, so, so should we, should we just make everyone, should we make all academics behave like open source? Should we ask people to share all their uh, um, work online? I, I mean, that would be nice, but I think there's more opportunity here. Um, we, we've actually taken some, some baby steps in this direction. Um, we have a, a collection of guides uh, for common, common workflows that people have on GitHub. We have one uh, academic-specific one, which is um, about making your code citable and writing, just even calling it this. Uh, lots of people sent me emails telling me that that was a terrible title. Um, um, just because you should be able to cite something with a URL, giving something a DOI doesn't necessarily make it citable. But this was to make a GitHub repository a little bit more uh, look and feel a little bit more like something that might get into a, a set of references in a, in, a, in a journal publication. And so, so this is a way you can take a GitHub repository, you can connect it to Zenodo, which is one of the uh, kind of data publishers uh, that's run by a group at CERN. And you, uh, you get the DOI, uh, and you get a, it gets deposited and archived in Zenodo. And, uh, and, um, and there you go. Um, and this is a, so here's matplotlib, which is a popular plotting library in Python. Uh, this integration's been used about 3,000 times, which I think is kind of pretty good. Um, that's 3,000 pieces of research software that have been deposited. Um, and you know, given that this would be a very weird thing for somebody who wasn't interested in DOIs to do, I think probably most of those people are academics doing that. So that's kind of interesting. But I think there's more. This is you know. So but this actually isn't something that an open source maintainer would typically do. Uh, this is a fairly fairly unusual uh, kind of workflow for them. There are things that I think um, open source communities do well, and uh, that I said as I said at the start that I think we should basically. Just copy, and, and, and there's three things that I'm going to talk about today that I think uh, are either likely uh, to happen or are already happening or we're likely to see kind of more, and I think uh, we'd all benefit from. And the first thing is verification, and certainly in, 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 in academia, kind of benchmarking services around science. And so one thing that open source does incredibly well, uh, and here's a project that I maintain uh, for GitHub. This is our language detection uh, library. So if you put a file in GitHub, we try and detect what language it is. Um, the one thing that open source does very well is um, it's really, really important that you can quickly verify the quality of somebody's contribution. This is an open source project. It's MIT licensed, so it's got a fairly uh, permissive license. And here's the list of potential contributions that the community has made. These are Some of these are by myself. They're called pull requests on GitHub. We don't really need to bother ourselves with that, but each one of these 33 open pull requests is somebody saying, here are some changes to how Linguist works. And so I need to know as a maintainer, are these any good? Should I use them? Should I incorporate them? Uh, and so the, the, the kind of one of the workflows that's really, uh, really been uh, impressive to see evolve in, in open source in the last few years is the kind of metadata or the uh, processes around um, verifying whether something's good and, and how they, these are kind of exposed to the community. So if I click through and look into one, here's one uh, uh, um, from a particular, uh, this is Christmas time, you can see the uh, Santa hats. This is actually from a colleague. Um, um, but you can see here that we've got 
some general title, uh, you know, there's, there's something, there's some hack in the code that um, this, this change is going to improve upon. And we can see, as you can see here, there's a comment uh, mentioning some people. And then we've got these, uh, underneath, we've got these three um, lines here. And these are actually the code changes here. And then there's some more comments, and then there's some code review going on. But if I go to the bottom of this page, you can see here, uh, we've got this merge with caution. And actually, what's happening here, this is kind of orangey-yellow at the moment. And it says, Travis CI build is in progress. Well, what does that mean? Well, so what's going on is, actually, there's a third-party service is actually running all, there's a whole load of tests, statements, uh, executable codes that assert functionality in the library. There's some statements, um, uh, uh, expectations made about how the code should work. And this service, Travis, that isn't run by us, <coughs> is running the test. And you can see uh, green is good, uh, is the convention in open source. And you can see the build has passed. And actually, it's been tested against lots of different versions of the programming language. If you drill into any of these, you can see, you can see all the tests being run individually. Um, but this is just a kind of a normal standard practice. There's some testing. There's some verification going on here. Uh, this is a different library, but there's a whole bunch of different uh, metrics that uh, communities use here. This is one called Code Climate, which uh, there are some metrics you can apply to software to decide if it's well written. Is there duplicate code? Is there, are there comments? Uh, are there functions? Everyone, I don't know, anyone who's written any code will have, will have opened up something either yourself or a colleague has written. It's like 6,000 lines of Fortran or something. And you're like, what the hell does this thing do? You would get a poor score if you had a kind of a 5,000 line method in, in Code Climate, and as rightly you should. Uh, so they kind of score the quality of the code. But what happens is when all these tests run, you get this kind of verification step that says, hey, the, all the kind of processes you have, all the build steps that you have to verify the quality of this are good. You might want to merge this. And in fact, this button uh, you know, goes green, and you can merge it in. Good to go. And this is not, so this is a software thing. Going back to that CMS project, these, uh, this collaboration uses extensively. So you can see here, there's about uh, 200 people work on the CMS pipeline. Uh, they've got a robot coming in here that's called CMS Build. So this is an automated script that comes in and talks to, uh, talks to the research team as they're building it. And they use labels like you wouldn't believe, as you can uh, see. So they use labels to monitor their process. But you can see here, they actually have, you know, somebody's edited a code path, and then they CC in the relevant people here uh, to, to uh, tell them to come and have a look. And then actually their convention is they actually have even automated the sign-off process. So somebody got, this guy got an email and he just sent a plus one. And if those, I think if a couple of people in this group do a plus one, then the robot automatically builds. And so this, these kind of processes are possible in um, software because it's such an unforgiving medium. You can write expectations. You can write code that describes functionality. I, we don't necessarily always have that luxury in in academia, especially when we, we don't have kind of uh, computational or machine-readable ways of stating, uh, stating knowledge. But, but there's definitely opportunity there for automating processes, having, having robots doing and verifying some of this work. And Fernando Perez, who uh, was the original creator of the IPython and Jupyter Notebook, he's got this wonderful blog post that I encourage you all to read. He's got actually an excellent blog. Um, he's got this really lovely phrase. Uh, he's a neuroscientist by training. But you know, open source is, and for many reasons, maybe because we don't speak the same language, we're geographically separated by different time zones, open source is reproducible by necessity. These projects would not work. They just simply would not work if there weren't a set of processes that enabled reproducibility. So what can we do in academia? Well, actually, I think one of the things that's kind of really interesting to me, and we're seeing some of this happening already, is benchmarking services in research. So. Um, this feels very similar. It's kind of verifying or uh, reproducing work. And so one of the, one of the uh, experiments that I've been helping with past year or so is uh, the Atlas team. So um, this is the other experiment on CMS now. So every time, you know, the Atlas, this is a collision happening in the Atlas the simulation of that. Every time there's a collision in Atlas, there's this huge volume of data produced. Um, and the kind of depressing thing about... Um, the kind of state of particle physics theory is, you know, we have our standard model, and you know, we predicted the Higgs, and we found it, so that's great. Um, but we have this, um, we have the standard model, and we have all this data, and we can apply these models to the data products, and we can, you know, calculate some kind of fit, 
and we can get some kind of score, and we can say, yes, this is a, you know, this is a good, we believe the standard model is correct in this sense. There is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, papers in the, the uh, particle physics theory literature where people are just kind of tweaking the numbers a little bit. They're kind of playing around with some kind of uh, decay function of some particular particle, and then they rerun the analysis. They use their new model, but it's still just a very, very small tweak on uh, the kind of standard model, not proposing a new particle necessarily. And they rerun it, and they say, oh, well, you know, we get a slightly better fit for whatever. And then out comes a paper. And the, 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 the team who uh, kind of made this observation, it's a group at NYU, they were kind of frustrated by this. Uh, they were kind of, this isn't, these aren't necessarily particularly uh, groundbreaking contributions to the particle physics theory. These are just people tweaking the numbers, getting a publication out. So they've actually got this project called Recast. And uh, the idea here is that let's get all of these papers out of the literature. They're not necessarily worthy of a publication, right? So let's, and there's a paper up in the archive here you can read. And what they do is they've got a website where you can define the model. It's just a parameter file that you submit. And you submit your new parameter file. They rerun the analysis on the CERN infrastructure, and they give you your result. But they're just listed on a website, right? They're not worthy of necessarily paper. Some of them will be. Sometimes you'll find something incredible, but most of them are not. And so let's get them out of the literature. It's just noise. And so this is, this is one example. There's excellent examples as well in, um, in uh, genomics. Uh, there's this problem in genomics where people will publish a paper that says, my you know, uh, sequencing algorithm or my alignment algorithm is faster than anybody else's. And people are like, oh, really? OK. And then you go and look, and what it turns out is they kind of massage the data into some particular format that makes it easier to do their analysis. And so this is a website that tries to take all of the, all of the um, algorithms, all of the methods that people use, and I have another 10 there, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, and, then, um, and, then, uh, and then just compare them, compare their performance. So again, pulling this stuff out of the literature. Sometimes people are going to make breakthrough changes in, in uh, the performance of these uh, algorithms, but most of the time it's some particular flavor of their algorithm applied to their particular data format, and that's not necessarily a real result. And so there's, uh, that's happening uh, in a number of places. There's this Global Alliance for Genomics, and they've got a whole working group who are doing benchmarking. So that's, a, that's one thing I think you know, there's ample opportunity to, there's lots of areas of research where we can, where there's papers like that where we can take that stuff out of the literature and actually uh, copy the kind of open source strategies. The other thing that I think uh, is likely to happen more, and so I, I guess I am predicting now, um, uh, is that I think we're going to see more innovation around um, where there's kind of shared challenges, shared data products. Going back to that large synoptic survey telescope. So this thing is going to produce two primary data products. It's got a continual stream of data coming off the telescope every night, every hour, every minute. And then there's going to be these kind of yearly, quarterly data releases. So the kind of challenge that people are facing is this is what a transient looks like, right? It's a small patch of the sky, and it's got a little white fuzzy blob in it. And the question is, what is that? Is it a gamma ray burst? Is it an asteroid? Is it a cosmic ray? Uh, and so th th and the, the, w they're looking at probably about 100 million of those things a night, right? And so the question is, what do you do with 100 million little pictures of uh, 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 pixelated pictures, some of them will be very interesting for your kind of research. And so the thing that happens in open source is that there's this kind of modular approach to the way that software is built. You kind of pick and choose pieces that you want to put together. And the, in the end, your software, the product that you produce, is, is, is the difference of those. It's the combination of those and some additional functionality. And so there's this ubiquitous culture of reuse in, in open source. And I think this is something we can do well in academia too. And so, so when we think about an ecosystem around data products, well, let's take a, a real re research case. So, so we've got this continual data stream. We've got 100 million of these things a night. Say I'm interested in type 1a supernovae. Some of these, some of these things will be new exploding stars. They're very interesting. We, and they're, crucially, we need to get an early measurement of the spectrum of these things. So we need to get them as soon as they come off the, as soon as they come off the telescope. So Somebody is going to have to, and this is an open data product, by the way. This is open to the whole of uh, the UK as well. Uh, uh, um, this is a federally funded program in the, re in the US. So this, is open, this project has an open data policy for partners. 
So some of these are going to be stars, uh, some of them are going to be low-flying rocks, and some of these are going to be wolf ray stars, some of them are going to be supernovae. Some of those rocks are going to be near-Earth objects, which if you've ever watched Armageddon, you should care about. Um, and some of them, I think, and I think the opportunity here is, you know, Josh Bloom at Berkeley, who's very interested in machine learning and algorithms and methods, is going to be producing his curated stream of type 1A supernovae. <coughs> and if I'm a researcher, I think I probably just want to subscribe to that because I've read his paper, I know he does his work very well, I'm just going to filter out the noise and just listen in to, uh, into his data stream. And so I think the opportunity for kind of reusing and curating, curating the, uh, the, the, the data products that come from noisy instruments is really, really exciting. And the crucial thing here is when you get one of these, you want to use one of these to look at it. And this is a telescope that costs about $100,000 a night to operate. So follow-up is expensive. So especially when you've got this kind of noisy survey instruments and uh, uh, expensive follow-up, then, then this becomes ever more important. And there's actually, uh, going further, there's actually some really nice uh, work being done by this group called Algorithmia, who are basically kind of, they've turned this into a marketplace. So they've got an open marketplace for algorithms that you can just execute on demand. So here's one that does LDA analysis on a GitHub repository. So you can give it a GitHub address and it will tell you, it tries to tell you what it thinks the project is about. And so, so that's the second one. The third one, and I promise I'm nearly finished, um, is, is that, uh, uh, that normal citations aren't and won't ever be really sufficient for software. And I think there's a number of important reasons uh, why. I think increased reliance, especially in data intensive uh, research, is gonna rely on more tools and methods, and I think we need something better than a kind of sti static citation. And Ed Lazowska at uh, UW has a really uh, nice uh, phrase he uses here. Uh, the, the academic environments today we have don't reward the people that build tool builders. Most, most uh, software engineers end up uh, 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 at some point, certainly if you're on the West Coast, getting on the Google bus down to Mountain View. Um, and so here's, here's a project uh, that's near and dear to my heart called AstroPy. Uh, this is a very popular uh, open source library in astronomy, and if we look, uh, this gets tens of thousands of downloads a month. It's worth pointing out that there are only about 10,000 astronomers in the world who would be interested in this software. So it's a reasonable assumption to say that a lot of astronomers use this. Uh, there is a paper about this project. It has been cited 60 times. This is not, uh, uh, there is, this is a, a poor number of citations, I would argue, given the level of use and adoption in here. And so there's a number of reasons that this might be happening. Uh, the journals might not be allowing software citations. People might not think to cite software. But there's something definitely going wrong here. And again, third duplication from Scott's uh, David Donoho. Publishing a paper is about code especially is just advertising. And so one of the things that uh, um, uh, I've been uh, um, thinking a lot about recently is some work that Dan Katz, who's uh, at the NSF, did. He put together about this idea of transitive credit and this idea that what about if we had papers, every paper had a unit of credit that you could apply. And uh, so this paper might have two authors, they might give them both selves 20% uh, credit, but you actually might cite an earlier paper and give that a significant amount of credit. But you would then also apply some amount of credit to the software and the data. And we, we wrote a little paper about this. Uh, it's Dan's idea. I just did some work with him to think about how this might be implemented. But there'd be then this idea that you have this kind of credit map that can be applied, and then you've got a credit kind of dependency tree going through the literature. And especially for software, where authorship isn't static, this thing becomes really important. Because going back to Linguist, if we have a look at, this is a community project. 500 people or so have contributed to this. And if we look, uh, you know, we expose that information in GitHub, you can see authorship over time. So Josh, the original library author, is still the number one committer, but you can see for the past, uh, for about the past year, I'm actually the primary author, right? Or am I? What, what's my role on the project? And I think, you know, certainly when you have software, which is a living product, usually uh, over some kind of static, static contribution to the literature, we, we need to think a lot about how authorship evolves. There And so, you know, open source, I don't think, has necessarily solved that, but it, it exposes this information. Uh, open source doesn't necessarily care about citation. And so this, this is a project called libraries.io that basically implements the page rank algorithm for software that uses other software and ranks it. Again, more metrics. Metrics are everywhere in open source, and I know we're going to hear about altmetrics later today. This is, you know, the number of uses of this project uh, uh, um, over time. So consumption metrics are everywhere. So, and of course, there's you know uh, metrics that GitHub exposed too, the kind of social, uh, the social fo following 
of, of the project. So where does progress like this come first? I, I, in truth, I don't know. I think probably the, the, some of the places where we've seen it already. But I think probably the right question to answer is where do communities naturally form? And I think, uh, and I think the answer to that usually is around either a shared challenge or maybe somewhere where shared data is the only way to do your research because maybe the data is so expensive to collect already. And so I think if I were to ask you all to try something out, uh, uh, I would encourage you to look at ways in which research can be done more exactly. Uh, so where you can state uh, 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 you know, in, 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 uh, in explicit terms some expectations of, of research. Uh, and look at areas of academia or, where, or areas of publishing where peers would most easily recognize value. Everyone understands these benchmarking papers. It's quickly obvious when you see these benchmarking websites that they're, they're making a useful contribution. And so very finally, I think for me, when I look at the difference between academia and open source, I think open source has developed many mechanisms to solve what we're reaching for, for in academia. I think the challenge for us is to adapt and evolve in this new collaborative age. So thank you. <laughs> I would have many questions, but I just have one, which is, do you think the, the, the system of incentives in academia is in any way close enough to the open source mindset that I don't think it's really a technical issue of having different forms of credit, like some things you describe, but isn't there it's like two worlds colliding and it's just not fitting with each other? So there's Similar, like, let's take the Wikipedia model of credit and editing, etc. It's also more closer to what, what you're doing. And it's just a different way of giving credit to people where it doesn't matter who did what, but it's just the product. So how do you see that line ever? Yeah, I think, that, yeah, the hard thing is, you know, we expose lots of information. Um, and all the kind of open source platforms have always kind of done that. It's been easy to see, relatively easy to see who's done what. I think in truth, um, you're right, the, you know, what, what my, uh, you know, what my score is relative to my peers is not something that's kind of numerically calculated typically in open source. And I think that's, it's more about, um, it's more about the community product usually. Um, I think um, we just, I would say, I, I don't, I, in truth, I don't have an answer for you. I think, I think they are not the same, but I think, um, I think we could, um, I think lots of the ways, lots of the processes that open source communities follow are directly transferable. I think the, we, there isn't a credit model to copy in open source other than uh, if your project is widely used, and I think this is where software is directly related. If it's widely used, then I think that can be measured relatively easy, easily, especially in open source, and I think we could, that's, um, you know, consumption, it feels like citation to me. Um, um, so, yeah, some things are transferable. I think most probably aren't. Anybody else? So you talked a lot about um, you know methods and examples you mentioned about how people can um, get credit for the code that they wrote, you know, and be able to share it and um, collaborate on all that work. A lot of it is focused on the code. Mm -hmm. Now there are a lot of fields in academia that doesn't really do much work on coding. Mm -hmm. I mean, for instance, if you're in the social sciences or even humanities, mm -hmm. you know, their needs might be very different. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think are some of the things that we talked about today that could be potentially adapted and applied to benefit those academics who don't really do coding all the time? So I, I actually disagree with you. I think the social scientists do lots of coding. Um, not as much, but um, like last meeting I was at, we were talking about it was in Copenhagen about data factories, and so this idea that you've got all these social networks, all these, these data products, and there's lots of, it doesn't feel like you know, grand simulations, but it's data preparation, data manipulation. This is coding too, right? And so anything that feels like, anything where you're handling data and you're not just sorting it by hand, I think is, 
is, is software in my mind. And so I think maybe I should have been a bit more careful about defining what I mean by software. I think you know, the script that you use to prepare your data is software and arguably is worth sharing. I mean, what, for me, there's an enormous opportunity in the social sciences, especially when people are, maybe you're looking at census data or something like that. You have, you're often all using the same core data set and then going through the same, doing the same analysis, but then not sharing that initial kind of data preparation stage. That feels both grossly wasteful and presumably lots of people are making errors there. I think there's a huge opportunity for, for sharing that. So I, yeah. So, yep. Just make an interjection from the floor. Go for I, it. At one time, I described software as capitalized technique. Right. Because, you know, in some sense, it is codified technique. Mm -hmm. You make it, you commodify it, you put it out there. Yep. So you're right, you need to work out, I think, what we want to regard software as. It mm -hmm. doesn't have to be wrapped in a package or right. appear in some sort of uh, comment line or whatever. Right. It's how you take it from something that somebody can do, you give them the work. But rather than that, we've now commodified it. We've given it to a machine. Yep, yep. I, think that's, I like that. Okay, so I think on that note, that brings us to the end of Arfon's talk. So thank you very much again, Arfon. Thanks.